Layovers, your weekly dose of aviation innovation. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard from the flight deck. This is Paul Pabadivitriou. Hello everybody, this is Alex Hunter. We'll be your pilots for this show about the news, the startups and the technologies defining the modern air travel experience. Our flight time today, 57 minutes, and we expect an on-time arrival. Coming up on this flight, we will buy a Virgin America, and will the brand survive? Airspace, when Airbus brands its wide-body cabins for the travelers. Ryanair decides to become nice. Is Virgin Atlantic finally mulling a long-haul, low-cost product? As crews misbehave in flight, they might love the new A350. Boom, the startup that wants to solve supersonic travel. When the UK has a shortage of biscuits, it sends 777s to the rescue. The infamous hijacker selfie and SSI for their Iron Maiden 747. As we reach our cruising altitude, I'm going to turn off the fast seatbelt sign for you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, and let's turn on those noise cancelling headphones. Flight 37 to Larnaca. Hi, Alec. Larnaca. In the news for lots of exciting reasons this week. <laughs> yeah, and the totally opposite side of where you are right now, right? Yes, I am in my in-law's walk-in closet in California, which is <laughs> acoustically perfect. <laughs> it's the best spot in the house to do this. But yes, I'm in sunny California for another three weeks. We both actually uh, are using different setups for the audio this time. So we hope for our listeners that everything will go right. Please accept our apologies if there are any hiccups you during the recording. Lots of, lots of uh, news, uh, starting off with, of course, this is why we chose Larnaca. Uh, I used to live in Cyprus, so I know that airport very well. Usually it's not in the news, but this time there was a uh, Egypt Air hijacking that turned out to be not very grave at the end, because of course, when you hear hijacking at first, people were freaking out, or the terrorism, etc. But apparently it was just a guy trying to be reunited with his ex-wife or something. Yeah, this is a crazy story. And it's one of those ones where the first thing you think is, I'm really glad it ended peacefully. No one was hurt, no one died. This is the best way a hijacking can end. And it turned out, I think, pretty quickly that this guy was emotionally unstable and not, you know, a terrorist, which, you know, the first thing I said to you was, a hijacking that kind of that they demanded the airplane be taking somewhere. What is this, 1983? What's happening here? But it, <laughs> it, all, it, it ended well. The guy was, as you say, trying to get reunited with his ex-wife. He wanted to deliver a letter to her. So he, he strapped a makeshift explosive belt to himself, which I think everybody on board quickly realized was like toilet roll cartons and, and not much else. And it all kind of degenerated very, very quickly. But it ended well. That's all that matters. The, the pilot decided that he had to act as if it was a real Oh, absolutely. Pilot. Absolutely. They rerouted. A few passengers were first let go, then pretty much pretty quickly and it folded and everybody was let go. But there was this added story of this British guy who took a selfie with the terrorists so in the funny. plane. <laughs> so funny. And I think this is, this is the clearest indicator to anybody that they knew very quickly that this guy was not an actual threat. Uh, because there's this, as you say, wonderful selfie the guy took where he's grinning like an idiot. Kind of, I think he's even giving a thumbs up when standing next to this bemused, bespectacled, quote-unquote, hijacker. Um, <laughs> it just makes the whole thing laughable. <laughs> yeah, the guy is actually a health and safety inspector in the UK, which also makes it very... <laughs> a <laughs> risk-averse have... uh, profession, uh, if there ever was one. So he probably thought, uh, yeah, this, this situation is pretty safe. We will put the link in the show notes of uh, both the selfie, but also the selfie in context, because he was sent over WhatsApp, and you see the, his friends reacting like, what the hell, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> There's a guy with, with you know, a suicide belt next to you and stuff. I mean, it's nice we can laugh about it. There was also a comment from the um, president of Cyprus, which I'm not sure was appropriate, but he said, always there is a woman. Now all the uh, wives in the world are asking their husbands, oh, you never hijacked a plane for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, you wouldn't expect, well, maybe you would expect that from a high-level politician, but uh, yeah, the whole thing is just one of those stories that's going to get told in airport bars for the next several decades. I've mentioned, uh, because of course, when this whole story was unfolding, uh, there was a lot of articles about plane hijacking. Uh, there was one uh, comment that I found very interesting in an article by Reason.com that says between uh, 1961, when the first plane hijacking in American airspace occurred in 1972, 159 commercial flights were hijacked Jeez. in the United States alone. To tell you guys that, yeah, it used to be much worse. And I mean, it's still very safe to fly. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it's important to reinforce that. 
uh, sad story, though. It was uh, last week. There was a bomb in Brussels, in Brussels airport, plus in the uh, metro of the capital of Belgium. Our sympathies, of course, to all the victims. It was, I mean, I think you wrote on Twitter cowards you used what was the word you used yeah i think it was cowards uh what can we say it's it's, it's it's a long line of terror attacks that have been hitting uh the european shores of course this time is in an airport not that it matters most or not but of course it when they wanted to disrupt our way of lives the airport for those who try to travel to brussels is still closed to this day uh there's been footage of the three guys they were simply getting into the airport with trolleys each of them had a luggage each of these luggage had a bomb inside. Two exploded, the last one, because I think the guy kind of ran away. It didn't explode, thankfully, because it was apparently the biggest bomb. Do you think, Alex, uh, we will see the same type of security we have in some uh, emerging nations where you have a first security check before the entrance to the terminal? Very possibly. I think this type of attack has been highlighted as a very serious possibility for several years now. I remember three or four years ago, Heathrow was on high alert because they identified a pre-security attack, meaning they knew there were going to be a lot of people milling around waiting to check in or, or lining up to go through security and that that was a target of opportunity. So they kind of redid things at Heathrow subtly. They didn't announce the changes, but you'll never notice big clusters of people anymore because they realized that this was a possibility. And sadly, that possibility has been realized. So we may well see that, as you say, that pre-security screening, which if you've been to Istanbul and, or anywhere in Mumbai, places like that, you have to go through full security before you can even get into the airport to drop off your bags and check in. Would that have prevented this? Probably, but the cost and time and resource necessary to implement something like that is, is, is of course, astronomical. Not to mention that you're displacing the problem because then you can just make the bomb explode in the parking lot of the yeah, airport. Yeah, exactly. It's absolutely. And then you'll go further. I mean, you, I remember, for I think it was in Manila, uh, there were checks before the airport. I mean, you can you can further down there the checks, but at some point it just displaces the problem. I mean, it, I, I don't have a solution for it, by the way. It's just that it's a sad state of affairs. You've been uh, recently to a country that is used to uh, having a lot of security at the airport. You were in Tel Aviv, I think, right? That's right. Yeah, that was a very, very interesting experience purely from a from an airport perspective. I knew the reputation that the airport had for being, well, having world-class security at every level, but it, it was not what I expected it to be. It was it was a fascinating process. So did you clear out security quite easily or did you find it no. uh, very intrusive? You know, it's funny because my... The, the chap that drove me to the airport, who was a, he's a professional taxi driver, this is what he does. He said, no, no, it doesn't take very long at all to go through security. You know, I would, I would only leave an hour before your flight to get to the airport. Boy, am I glad that I did not heed his advice because it took a long time. And it wasn't be, the queues moved quickly. It wasn't about that. It was just the type of scrutiny, I guess is the best word, that, that everybody seemed to go under. There was nothing different about putting your bag through the machine or anything like that, or the things that you had to take out, like laptops and, and you know, liquids and all that. that. That didn't feel any different. It was the line of questioning that was so interesting. Like they, they looked at my passport and asked questions about every stamp that was in my passport that was regional. So why did you go to this country? Who do you know there? And it wasn't aggressive or invasive. It was conversational. That's what was so awkward in a way. It wasn't like they were trying to get information out of me. It was purely, it felt like I was chatting to somebody my age. The, the chap was my age and it was like, oh, so what took you to Muscat? I, you know, was it, was it nice? Why, who, do you know anybody there? And you knew exactly what they were doing, but it was, it was, I've never experienced anything like that before. This is exactly my recollection of uh, the last time I was at Ben Gurion Airport, because that's the one we're talking about, was, wow, 16 years ago. I didn't fly a lot, which is the local career, but still, I remember the line of questioning coming in, coming out, even, of course, uh, at the separate terminal. I think I flew from Amsterdam. It's the example that a lot of countries are mentioning always, where they say, okay, can we really go further into technology? Of course we can. We mentioned some of the examples. I think it was last episode we mentioned this constant scanning all throughout the airport via the heat cameras, for instance. But they say that at some point we will have to address the person-to-person, -person, like you just mentioned, the line of questioning, the professionalism of, not that anyone in border control is not professional, for instance, in uh, um, Ethro, to take one example, but they've not been trained the same way to ask the questions that will actually flag you or not. There was an article in the Daily Mail. It dates back from 2010, actually, 
it was very interesting to read what's the security system they're using, which is really not relying a lot of technology. There's still a lot of technology, but a lot of it is about just questioning you, just asking questions. Yeah, Yeah, I think this was a really interesting article, and it absolutely reinforces my experience. The, The quote here, which I think is absolutely spot on, says, we operate on the principle that it's much more effective to detect the would be terrorist than to try to find his bomb. Which makes, on the face of it, a lot of sense. Their line of defense is polite, highly trained agents. And that's exactly what it felt like. These people were very, very polite. They were clearly trained in not just in frisking somebody and trying to find a physical thing, but also looking for telltale psychological signs. It was really, really interesting. And, and, you know, using that kind of behavior pattern analysis is, it's got to be effective. I mean, it's clearly effective. Maybe that's something one day other governments will invest in more thoroughly to actually heighten the behavioral side of the security screen, not only the technological side. Well, we'll see. I, I still think that after Brussels, we'll see more and more scrutiny in airports uh, in Europe and the US problem. You know, they all say they're already at the highest level, but there's always a level that goes higher or something, it seems to me. Yeah. Back to the last episode, uh, when you talked about uh, the story you had with the TSA, you and your travel companion were both cleared to go on TSA prey, whilst actually your companion was not a US citizen. We got a lot of feedback on Twitter, Facebook, etc. I cannot mention it all, but a few people have basically said that it happened to them already. For instance, I have uh, Craig McCormick. He says that as a United 1K card holder, I almost every time get TSA pre tickets, even though I have a UK passport. So he says it's not uncommon for him that it happens. His research says that you are automatically enrolled due to frequent travel to the US, although it's hit or miss. It's, it's strange because when you go to the TSA website about that pre, it still says you have to be a US resident or a US citizen. That's it, right? There's something so, not right there. There's something not right. I mean, it's, I guess... You cannot enroll yourself without having any pattern of travel behind you like a like a United One Care would have without being an American or, or resident. But my travel companion was not a 1K, nor was he a very frequent traveler to the US. I, I still maintain that this was a technology glitch. Yeah, me too. No, me I'm too. not saying that Craig or anybody else is wrong. I absolutely believe them. I just think in this instance, this was a technology glitch. Craig's Twitter is destructive pics because I always had to people who connect to us. Uh, Marcus Volcher, whom we mentioned many times already in the show, thank you, Marcus, for always listening, says that he had a similar pre-check experience. He actually has the guys, some boarding passes get to pre-randomly. So it's strange, but it happens. Good for those who are getting it, right? Why not? But the whole thing is not completely clear to everyone. There was another tweet that made me really laugh from John Edgar Park, uh, who actually gets a TSA compliant on a multi-tool, and uh, that cleared that tool in all the bad, TSA bad. checks. <laughs> I mean, that's hilarious, but that's also, that's, oh gosh, that's that's bad. <laughs> Anton uh, at Derluz on Twitter also says that, because we're in that topic, that some credit cards in the U.S. reimburse the uh, TSA Fast Track or Global Entry fees. Uh, so oh, that's, that's Because cool. you mentioned that it was 80 bucks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 I agree. I mean, all of this aside... It's already proven its worth to me, the $80. I'm flying to Santa Barbara next week, and I'll be able to use it there and back. So, yeah, I, I think it's it's great, especially at, at busy times of the day, as long as they have the lines open. <laughs> yeah, which is not always guaranteed. Not right? always, especially at smaller airports. Since I'm doing shout outs, a few others uh, at already to anywhere uh, has written a blog post. Uh, he was looking for aviation podcast and he found his five favorites were amongst the five. So thank you so much. Was, actually, I, I still forget slash get a kick out of the fact that people listen to us. <laughs> Absolutely. By the way, since your voice is this time, Alex, uh, more deep because you're in this perfect environment for recording. He actually says that my voice is so soothing that I could read the phone book and he will still listen to it. So I hope that you will say the same about Alex after this episode. No, I, you know what? You're, the, whoever, uh, the ORD to anywhere folks are not the first people to say that, that Paul's voice is the reason why they listen to this podcast, which uh, <laughs> I love it. But honestly, that review uh, made our days yeah, amazing when you wrote about you. us. So thank you so much. By the way, and I'm not saying that to you, uh, but to anyone Apparently, doing podcasts, you're supposed to do that. Guys, if you want to write reviews about us on iTunes, uh, please do. I, I've never done one myself, so I'm not going to be complaining if you never do. But I mean, why not, guys? Thank yeah. you so much. If you love us, please do. Yes. 
<laughs> yes. Also, Mathieu, he has a website called Milesopedia. It's a f- website for frequent flyers in uh, French Canada. So he's actually uh, speaking French. He tells me that about my story of automatic check-ins that Air France also allows uh, automatic check-ins. Oh, uh, cool. Swiss is not the only airline. I-, I thought I saw it somewhere. Probably was it was Air France. Thank you, Mathieu. He's at T-E-W-M-G-D on Twitter. Two M-G-D. So I don't know exactly how you pronounce your Twitter handles, but that's the story of all Twitter handles. <laughs> yeah. You haven't seen mine. It's my last name. How can you pronounce that? Also, a quick shout out to Glucode. He's very interactive with us. Uh, and he says that it's still a great show. So thank you, Sunil, for that. So you traveled to Tel Aviv, but you also traveled to the U.S. You didn't use Virgin, right? No. Well, I did until the last minute. I booked my wife and kids on full fare tickets on British Airways just so I knew that they would get there. But I needed to have a little bit of flexibility on this trip just in case I needed to zip back to the U.K. for a couple of reasons. So I used Miles because there was no availability for reasonably priced seats. So I booked my trip to San Francisco on Virgin because BA didn't have any seat. And I was kind of feeling slightly guilty that the fact that my wife would have to have our two sons by herself on that long flight. But (laughs) there was really nothing else that we could do. And then BA did have availability coming back. So we're at least all on the same flight together. But what I did after I booked the flights way back in like January is I set up an alert using expertflyer.com, which is... Yeah, I want to listen to you about that because I've tried the trial, but I think I've never understood its power. So I want you to actually tell me about it. This is a great site. It took a little bit of practice to get used to because it's a very, very powerful tool. And it's like five bucks a month for the basic premium subscription and 10 bucks US dollars a month for the sort of weapons grade version. But I was able to set up an alert for this very specific flight saying if an award seat becomes available in the economy cabin, notify me and then I can jump on it. And we got closer and closer and closer to our departure date. And I basically for, I stopped looking. I did. I, you are able to look at seat maps. You're able to look at selling buckets. And I could see the flight was still pretty open, but I'd basically given up and we've made all of the logistical arrangements so that we, you know, where are we going to meet at the San Francisco arrivals hall? You know, how, who was going to drop off who at, at Heathrow and all of that. And then as I was at Tel Aviv airport, I get an email saying they've just released seats. And I was able to sit in the departure lounge and book my mileage flight on British Airways. And we all flew over together. I canceled my mileage flight on Virgin and they were excellent about that. So right there, it, it paid for itself because we were all able to fly over together. It's a great, great great tool, especially if if you're a frequent flyer. Does it cover like most airlines? Yes. There are a few notable emissions, but none that have impaired me. Not only can you get all the things like that I just mentioned, but if you have a favorite seat, it will tell you if it gets released. It will give you all of the uh, the fair pricing. You can save like the queries. Really, really Im- impressive tool. I really need to, to start using it. Probably I made a mistake of actually signing up when I didn't have any forthcoming travel. So I put some alerts. There, since the you know, trial was only uh, seven days or something, if I remember correctly, then I forgot to kind of renew and, and buy in. And I, I, I will do it. I will do it and I'll report how it works. I have lots of trouble uh, coming up. Uh, but since we're on Virgin, many stories about the various virgins in the world. But the first <laughs> one is the, the big one because apparently Virgin America, you beloved Virgin America is up for sale. Yeah, this really caught me by surprise. There was an announcement that I only noticed because the stock price went through the roof that Virgin America had put itself up for sale. And when you dive into it, it actually makes a lot of sense. It's been a long time, almost 10 years since the original investors put up their not small amount of, of money to get this thing off the ground. The airline is profitable. It's gone public. So it it makes sense for them to want to cash out. But then, and I think this happened on Thursday or Friday, the stock went up another 10% yesterday when it emerged that, yes, this was happening and there had already been bids from JetBlue and Alaska and, and a few other people who, who we haven't figured out the identity yet. Now, there is a strong possibility that by the time this episode goes live, the announcement of who that suitor is will already be made. This seems to be moving very, very quickly. There have been so many articles and analysis across the the financial world about who it makes the most sense to acquire, what will happen 
you know, is there, are there any overseas investors, which of course is a complicated subject because U.S. airlines can only have a minority ownership from a foreign investor, 25% or less. 25%, so, yes, correct. Yes. So it's going to be interesting to see. I, I don't think the Virgin America brand will be around for much longer. That was, yeah, I don't that, think so either. That was always going to be a risk. It's a licensing agreement and it may not be rolled into any acquisition I hope it's JetBlue. I think that would be wonderful, but we'll have to see. It makes actually a lot of sense for JetBlue. I was a bit surprised by Alaska uh, because it came out from out of nowhere. A lot of Skift included said, uh, talked about Delta. I found that a bit strange, not even mentioning the all antitrust issues that would have that would have risen. I think it actually makes sense for JetBlue. Although, of course, like you said, if it's just JetBlue is almost guaranteed that the brand will disappear, they will simply roll out the service. I don't think they will keep it as a kind of premium product. No, it doesn't make any have. sense. I mean, with Alaska, there's a chance that it might because exactly yeah they have totally fault. different yeah. fleets very different brand positioning very different pro- i don't think it's going to be alaska alaska seemed to me to be a risk averse operation although they did acquire horizon a few decades ago but if they did they would do it and they would squash it because they've always been at competition with virgin america so that might be the only rationale for the acquisition but i'm, I'm hoping for JetBlue. JetBlue have a very strong brand. I don't think it makes any sense for them to say the whole company is going to become Virgin America. But who knows? Stranger things have happened. And it is true, like you said, that the Virgin America brand comes with all the licensing deals. It might be too expensive for Alaska to transform itself. But I mean, you never know, right? You never know. Uh, and like you said, probably it's a good time to, for the sale. They probably have gone as far as they could in terms of making this a solid airline without additional massive investment to grow it. So it has to be an acquisition or it has to be a massive investment. The foreign ownership rules uh, preclude a player like Etihad or a player like Qatar Airways to actually enter the fray. Of course, it could go up to 25%. They've done that in the past, especially Etihad. But it would have been interesting to see maybe someone with uh, deeper pockets try to kind of push the Virgin America brand further, but I don't think we'll see, we'll see that happening. Yeah, there was mention of uh, an Asian, quote-unquote, carrier, carrier getting yeah. involved. So uh, there, there, there may be, but they would obviously, as you say, have to partner with a U.S. entity to to make that happen. And I, I who knows? Who knows? It's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out over the next week. Yeah, it could be very quick. Virgin Australia, a uh, similar story. Our New Zealand actually wants to shed its stake. And it's a big stake because it's uh, more than 25%. It's the largest stakeholder in uh, Virgin Australia. They actually want uh, to get rid of it. There are many reasons why. I mean, uh, we have so many stories that I don't want to get too into. But I mean, it's interesting to see that there's movements there as well. And Virgin Atlantic, which is the other Virgin that goes from the UK to the US, which we just mentioned before, because Alex traditionally uses them. You mentioned in the last episode that they were thinking about going low cost. And I want to hear you about that. I think this message has been misinterpreted because it's come out four or five times over the last four or five years that Virgin was going to do a low cost carrier with the Virgin brand that would focus on on leisure routes out of Gatwick. Then there was the renegotiate or kind of almost remortgaging of those slots at Heathrow to allow for expansion. That Mm -hmm. started to talk, they started to talk about low cost there. But it seems like this would be a, it's really hard to describe it. It's it's basically to counter the threat of people like, wow, the Icelandic carrier, Norwegian Air Shuttle, who are doing long haul low cost, where, you know, you don't want to get squeezed by British Airways on the premium side and then be squeezed from the bottom by people like Norwegian and, and wow. So Virgin apparently are mulling strategies to do this. And one of the strategies that has been put forward, but certainly not confirmed, is this new company that's Virgin branded, but low cost and would focus on as they say in in Britain, the bucket and spade routes, so beach destinations and and, and things like that, with a more A three thirty centric fleet, which which makes sense. It'll be interesting to do. I still think that Virgin should find a way to buy Norwegian and just be done with it. <laughs> You know, but but you know, Delta is now also calling the shots for Virgin, so I'm not sure what will happen. I mean, but yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned A330 because they would have to almost take some of the A330s from Delta in order to have a fleet like that. Because yes. and they even say that the A330 is cheaper to run than the 787, the Dreamliner. We still haven't flown you and me. Uh, it's cheaper to run, so and that's the plane that Norwegian relies on. Yes. The thing that's most interesting about this, because again, this this conversation ha- has happened so many times. Are Virgin going to create a bucket and spade uh, or leisure, low cost carry? It's happened all the time. 
What's really interesting to me is that this announcement and comment came from Delta, not Virgin. Yep. The person commenting on this is the senior vice president for Europe, Middle East, and Africa for Delta, not Virgin Atlantic, which which I think says a lot about the relationship between Delta and Virgin Atlantic. And since we're talking about Airbus, uh, I was, Alex, invited for the first time as a representative of the media because we host that uh, show, Layovers, <laughs> by Airbus themselves to the launch of a new product uh, that was in London. It was last week. They actually launched a product called Airspace, and it's basically they're branding the cabin. It's interesting. They are moving to that direction because what they are saying is basically more and more people are actually, especially in social media, they are, you know, complaining or rejoicing about this or that aircraft. A bit of what we do here. You know, we like our 747s and we don't like our, like what, our A340 you don't like, for, for instance. Uh, and they say, we need to cater into that because we, so they want to both allow uh, airlines to still play a lot with it because, of course, you know, the airlines at the end, and especially the lessers uh, at the end, are the ones who are branding the plane. But they still want you and me and, of course, other people that might be less geeks than us on aviation to recognize that they are in an Airbus plane and that means quality. Yeah. And they're, start and they're starting that with a wide body plane, so the A330. And they've taken all the lessons that they've uh, successfully applied, actually, to the A350, you know, LEDs. I think there are like 50 million possibilities of LEDs. The, the very white cabins, the fact that the panels on the side are made in a way that even the person in economy was uh, on the window seat doesn't feel pressure on his shoulder if, he, if, if he's tall. Huh. They also talked about you know, some legroom, although they had to admit in the interview, the Q&A afterwards, that you know, legroom at the end of the day is, also, is still a decision by the, by the airlines themselves. It's very sensible for them to realize the power of someone saying, I want to fly on this airplane, I don't want to fly on that airplane. And it, it is happening. Even my, my mom, who has spent you know, a lot of her, her life exposed to the airline industry is vocal about her preference, especially for long haul. She's not a fan of the 346 simply because it's a 242 configuration. And she she also claims that the cabin air feels different. Like it, there's, <laughs> there's uh, maybe it's, it's the humidity or, or cabin air uh, altitude, but she, yeah, she, she notices that. So she, you know, this is an opinion, not just held by people like you and me, but but of the masses, they want to fly on particular airplanes. And I think it's a very sensible strategy for, for Airbus to take. The two aircraft they mentioned, of course, the A350, maybe it's very new, but obviously the A380. A lot of airlines uh, were seeing an uptick just because a lot of airlines, and there's not that many that have the A380, but they're seeing an uptick of confidence and appreciation when people were flying an A380. So there's something, we've already mentioned that with Emirates many times, but that people are really happy to fly that airplane. You would have loved the, the presentation itself because it was a lot about the brand values. You know, they, were, they did a lot of a very good exercise about how what Airbus means nice. and what Airbus should mean in the future. And they were talking a lot about the space, you know, the fact that this place should relax, this place should be able to live in, this place that has to be, of course, beautiful and inspiring uh, that these are the brand values you're connecting with that airspace product the judgment will be the day that airlines and of course the lessers because don't forget that i think almost 60 percent of the white body is actually uh, sold through lessers so lessers basically want the white canvas they want almost nothing in it and then they want to let the airlines play with it the judgment they will be sorry when uh, we'll have uh, the actual end result and see how it happens for the moment though when you are in the A350, uh, uh, I've never flown it, uh, sadly, yet. You can really feel you're in a modern and future-looking product. What was really cool, though, is that they had to allow you and me and other people that were at the event to basically immerse yourself in the experience. They had offered 360 VR virtual reality experience. Wow. And I was really in the plane. It really looked like I was in A350 Finero, although it's A330 Neo, the future product. But you could walk in the plane, you could see all the features. They've actually created new overhead bins that allow for more carry-ons. That's also something that Boeing is tackling. Uh, so it was a very impressive experience. Nice. Have you ever seen something like that? Or No. I, in fact, for those of you that follow us on Twitter, you may have seen it, but uh, we'll recirculate it. There's a fantastic picture of Paul with this VR headset <laughs> strapped to him as he's exploring this uh, this virtual uh, cabin. <laughs> it's a great idea. It's a great idea. And I think more and more companies are getting better at engaging their fan base is probably too strong a term, but enthusiasts in, in the space. And I think it's a, it's a really important strategic move. And Airbus have been leaders, not just in this, but in embracing 
entrepreneurship and acceleration and, and tech in general. And I think this is just a natural extension. From It feels like Boeing are, are not doing this as well. They're still doing the big out-of-home advertising campaigns when perhaps they should be doing a little bit more of this. It's always funny to hear, by the way, that Airbus has sold 777-A350s, actually. Uh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that, yeah, seven, 777 uh, orders for the A350. I encourage you to go on uh, airspace.airbus.com. You can see the product there. The experience is quite immersive as well. There's also a possibility to actually download, I think, part of the VR experience. That VR experience is interesting because when I, I talked to the guys there at Airbus, who were many of the execs, they told me they're not only using it for uh, you know, events like this, but they're also using it for testing products. We invite you to know, focus groups and having people in real life situations to feel how they would actually interact with a product. And also kudos to Airbus for not having only focused on the front of the cabin, but focused a lot on what happens in the economy. So I think yes. that's a very good point uh, for them. Have you seen, by the way, that uh, the A350, uh, they're thinking of going a split level for long haul. Have you seen that? No. Apparently, because part of the cargo hold is not being completely optimized for long haul for the 850-1000, they said that they could actually do a split level, put some of the galleys and the lavatories under the seats. I don't know exactly how it works. There was no design I could see about, but that's a consideration that Airbus is having, which actually reminds me of our friend Anton at Derlus on Twitter <laughs> uh, wrote that following comment. The biggest shame of Lufthansa scrapping the A340 is how good theirs were for joining the Mile High Club with those below the decks toilets. <laughs> I, and Derlus, maybe that will be possible for the A350 if they go, ever go split level because the lavatories will also be hidden. Uh, I'm not so asking funny. you, Alex, if you ever joined that club because you've already joined the club of people being stuck in an overhead bin in a plane. Yes, right? that, that's a much more exclusive club. <laughs> Talking about the Mile High Club, there was an article in the Telegraph that I found pretty funny where he had confessions of uh, air crew and there's a lot of them who had sex with a colleague in a plane, even sex with passengers. Yeah, 15% of the people surveyed in this, I think it was 750 uh, Brit British flight attendants, not British Airways flight attendants. Uh, yeah, 15%. But yeah, the a lot of these are kind of just sheer laziness, aren't they? Like uh, lying about the availability of duty-free products, a shortchanging. That, that, is, that is actually criminal. But then like accepting tips and gifts, which I think is the easiest to turn a blind eye to. Those people work so, so hard. Since we always talk about apps, there is a new app. I think it's called Meet Me at Airport. It's basically a Tinder for airports. I'm honestly not sure what you think about it. Oh, if you ever Exactly. I don't know if people have joined a Mile High Club at Ryanair, but Ryanair is implementing a new strategy. We've not always been very kind with Ryanair, you and me. We had lousy experiences, both of us, with them. But they are implementing a new strategy and they're starting to basically being nice. Do you think they will actually become really nice? Or I, do you think it's just I think they'll become thinking? nicer. I think it's brilliant. O'Leary is, is crazy, like certifiable, but he's also brilliant. And I, I admire him in many, but not all regards. And I think this makes total sense. They've got the volume of travelers and the volume of route and the volume of aircraft where they can continue to offer very, very low fares. But now they can start to widen the reach of their audience and target market by polishing the product and relaxing some of their more aggressive policies about fees and, and things like that. And they, they I, th I think, again, another brilliant strategic move. It comes back a little bit to what Airbus did with the airspace, They're reacting to a lot of the chatter on social media. Probably also Ryanair right realizes that although they could continue like this, having a softer side would actually also help them in their brand recognition, how people perceive them and also increase their business. By the way, they're also launching a, a corporate jet service. They have enough planes to say, oh, if you want to hire uh, one of our planes for a corporate jet, we'll actually agree to it. I don't know if you and me can uh, one day do that. <laughs> that would be nice. Of friends, but... Uh, it's not only the lousy, low-cost airlines. They're really shifting away from that. And I think that it's a good strategy. There was um, also an article in Skift, as always. Skift, the great resource about the marketing strategy of uh, Ryanair. Uh, they interviewed the CMO. Have you read it, Alex? Yeah, I have. And this, uh, Kenny Jacobs, who is the, he's reasonably new in the role. And he is talking so much sense about, about Ryanair's content strategy, about their brand positioning. They are looking to help customers make decisions and not get in the way of, of making those decisions with too much editorial content and, and things like that, which is 
flies in the face of just about every other airline's content marketing strategy. And I think they're going to do really, really well because it aligns with the entire product strategy for Virgin, for Virgin, for Ryanair. There's a Freudian slip for you. So yeah, I, I really like this guy and I really like what he has to say. It's a long, long interview on Skip, but it's absolutely worth reading. He, he talks about IFE and that the, he doesn't think that embedded traditional seat back IFE is going to last much longer, especially for non-premium airlines. The, the streaming to the seat that Southwest have implemented and many, many others is going to be the thing of the future. And uh, the uh, CEO of WOW actually agrees in another interview by Skift. He goes over why WOW could be successful. He goes into a little bit of that no frills travel. And he mentioned the same thing. He says, people talk about uh, in-flight entertainment, sure. The reality is most people now have smartphones, iPads, they have Netflix subscription, and they can do whatever they want with them. There's no need to actually add IFE on the planes. It shows that the strategy is no frills, but at the same time, no surprise bill at the end. So, you know, you're comfortable booking your travel yourself. You're comfortable taking care of yourself, buying your own food before you board and manage everything through an app. Wow is for you. And this is why he thinks that they will be uh, successful. We talked in the last episode about Norwegian, which is a competition of, of WOW. And uh, the husband in tow, our friend, mentioned that Air Asia also pre-serves food for people who have pre-ordered food before boarding. So that's the same thing than uh, Norwegian. And also, he corrected me. The nice videos are put on uh, YouTube, including the Singapore Air Show, were made by his wife, Amber. So hello, Amber. Sorry, I forgot to mention you in the other episodes. You know, actually, <laughs> that reminds me um British Airways have rolled this out, and I don't know if they've done it quietly. I certainly had never heard of it. When you go and manage your booking pre-flight, you can pay £15 to have a quote-unquote better meal in economy. If you do nothing, you'll still get their standard fare, which, you know, I've had worse. But if you pay 15 quid, you can upgrade your meal. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had no idea. They don't talk about this very much. I wonder if, if it's just a test on, on certain routes. Uh, if anybody's done it, if you're listening and you've done and you have ordered it, is it any good? I would love yeah, to. What's, what's the up, yeah, what's the upgrade? I mean, I, uh, that's what I'm wondering. Is it like a burger with fries or something? No, it, like I mean, do? it was when I looked, it was all pretty stock footagey. But it was an interesting, I mean, 15 quid is not a small amount of money. But no, it's, it's less not. than I suppose you would pay for a three-course meal in a restaurant. So I'd be fascinated to hear if any of you guys have actually paid that 15 quid. Maybe I should do it for, for science on the way home. <laughs> Do it for, for, for research for our show. You had found that actually the French are also going into low-cost, long-haul flying. Yeah, this we, we've debated this back and forth about uh, whether or not this was truly low-cost and long-haul. <laughs> it's basically a sub-brand uh, called French Blue, who are, this article is in French, so I've had to do my best to translate it. Um, <laughs> but it's basically, they're, they're doing low-cost, long-haul to the Caribbean. You know, they're going to refer to themselves colloquially as Sunline, which I quite like. It's a sub-brand of, uh, how do you pronounce it? Air... Uh, Air, Air Caraibe. There we go. I would have butchered that. <laughs> but it will have its own air operator certificate. So it is a separate entity in, in terms of that. They're going to have internet access on board. It's going to be very densely seated, 380-seat A330s. Wow. Yeah, which is a lot. So they're they're going to have economy and what they call improved economy, which is probably slightly less terrible. But yeah, it's definitely Air France have done it with with Hop. It seems to be something that's going on not just in France but also in in Germany. Don't you think that the line uh, between what we call nowadays long haul, low cost travel, and what it used to be called as basically holiday carriers like Thompsons and stuff, are, are they not almost merging? Because they're always, always being like chartered flights that would get you to the islands and they would get you to holiday destinations and there were no real travel. And now we're seeing these new brands coming up. Of course, they offer Wi-Fi, whatever. But at the end of the day, it seems that it's becoming closer, that the line is not always very clear whether or not it's or maybe long haul low cost always existed. We just call it a different name. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's actually confusing the consumer as well because they're going on expecting a standard service, i.e. food and drink provided, IFE, but they're not getting that. And whether or not the offset of the price and the ticket is worth it or even clearly communicated, I think is starting to cause some problems, especially when when people like Virgin Atlantic and British Airways and, and a lot of the American carriers charge for so many ancillaries already. 
still in the same breath, Indigo uh, from India is actually one of the largest low-cost carriers in the world, and Qatar Airways is interested to uh, acquire a stake in it. So it shows that Qatar is, again, trying to uh, grow not only by buying aircraft, but also by buying stakes in other airlines to probably do some interlining and expanding the network that way. It's an interesting development. Since we are in the region, there was a very ironic flight, I would say. Uh, there is an all-female crew from uh, Brunei. I don't remember the name of the, the airline. You'll tell there me, Alex. Royal Brunei. That landed in Saudi. So... <laughs> Basically, if I understand that correctly, you have three female pilots landing in the country where they are not allowed to drive. Yeah, there was a, <laughs> a healthy sense of irony there, and I'm sure it wasn't lost on the uh, the folks over at Royal Brunei. But, uh, you know, it's that article and this whole thing spoke volumes. But to me, when I saw the picture, the first thing I was like, wow, the 787 flight deck is stunning. <laughs> Absolutely stunning. You, it looks like kind of a sports car and a, a spaceship. You know, there's hardly anything there when you think of all of the bobs and dials and, and gauges and all of that from airliners of yore. This is, there's nothing. It's beautiful. But this is a, a, a funny story, but also a very serious story. Talking about a uh, funny story, but also very serious for people living in Britain, there was a shortage of digestive biscuits oh, that's very in serious. the UK. Exactly. Over the Christmas period, they had two <laughs> charter planes, two Boeing 777s, <laughs> to fly biscuits from Dubai back to the UK. That is wonderful. <laughs> but as one tweet said, civil unrest feared as biscuit shortage <laughs> strikes Britain. Amazing. Um, we could have done that with uh, supersonic travel. So we've been talking over uh, many episodes about many attempts to go supersonic travel. There's been the military has been implicated. I think Lockheed actually just released a new engine, I think, lately. There's been, of course, many of the aircraft manufacturers. But now there's an actual startup that is trying to reinvent supersonic travel. It's called Boom. Uh, that's actually a very nice name for it. Boom.ario is the website. They're backed by uh, Y Combinator. So it seems very serious. And if you look also at the pedigree of the people behind them, it looks very serious. It's almost the holy grail. Do you think they will be able to change anything, to deliver on anything about supersonic travel? No. <laughs> uh, I am so happy that there are a lot of people focused on the problem of resurrecting supersonic travel for the masses. So I'm so happy about that. Yeah, there's a UK-based company. There's a few in the US, um, both of which have extraordinary amounts of funding. I think it's the British one that has signed the deal with FlexJet or NetJets or, or one of those big fractional companies for uh, airplanes, and that deal was worth billions. This, I don't think going the startup route is the way to solve a problem of this magnitude. It's not very cheap to build an airplane, let alone a, a supersonic airplane, even when you have Uncle Richard involved. And Virgin apparently have gotten involved in this and have optioned 10 airplanes at a value of $2 billion. And I think that's for Spaceship One, the Spaceship Company, which is the manufacturing division of Virgin Galactic, they're going to get involved too. But I said this to you in a private message. I feel like this is, of all of the ones that are trying this, this is the most vapor wary. Ir irrespective of the of the pedigree of the people involved, there you know these are people that have worked on jet engines. They worked on the seven eighty seven. They did flight dynamics. It's not about that. These are all extraordinarily smart, talented. You know these are the bleeding edge aerospace engineers of the world. It's about availability of resource. It's about you know coming from inside a company like Lockheed or NASA or or something government backed because the barriers to entry are so so high that. You know, you're not going to go to Draper Fisher Jurvetson and say, can I have one and a half billion dollars to do this? Because they'd be out of their mind to do it because you're not going to IPO in three years. Well, it still reminds me of the other probably moonshot, as we call them right now, uh, of Hyperloop, you know, trying these uh, very fast trains yes. and tubes in the US and they're, they're building the first track, which is both fascinating and I'm not calling it vaporware, but I mean, of course, the, the road to success is so long. Yeah. I have the same sentiment here. I mean, I honestly wish someone, maybe that, maybe Boom, uh, figures it out because, like you said, I think you were locked in into economy for, I don't know, godly hours to go to San Francisco. 
we'd love to do that in only five hours. Uh, so uh, it would be great. But the road is so long that getting excited over technical articles and we might see a result maybe like, you know, 15, 20, 30 years down yeah. the line if everything goes right. And I maybe a lot of things I, could go wrong. I hope that, that I'm wrong. And, you know, because a lot of people said this about Tesla at the beginning. So many people yeah, are, exactly. are uh, working on electric cars. If it doesn't come from GM or Ford or Toyota, it's just not going to happen. And then all of a sudden, here we are, you know, 10 years later and Tesla are the market leader and the innovation leaders. So I want these guys to prove me wrong. I just don't know if this traditional startup route is, is the mechanic and framework necessary to, to give them the success they deserve. Yeah, but uh, good luck. I don't know if the Boom aircraft, if it's an aircraft, will ever uh, land somewhere, uh, but apparently now it should avoid uh, the worst airports as, rank, as ranked <laughs> by pilots. And the worst airport is LAX. Yeah, this Please. actually was lifted almost verbatim from a Reddit, uh, Reddit. AMA yeah. to ask pilots, what, you know, what airports do you not like? The thread itself was was more interesting in the article because you got the context and the commentary from the pilots themselves. But yeah, LAX was the undisputed champion of suckiness for airports for pilots. The taxiing because of the kind of perma construction that's always going on. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty funny. You know, you go from LAX at number one to Kathmandu <laughs> at number two. <laughs> Ethro is number six, especially Terminal 4, apparently, is hated by pilots. Uh, there is uh, Manila. I'm not surprised we'll get to there one day, but Manila is probably one of the worst airports in the world, uh, Terminal 1 at least. And Charles de Gaulle is listed there, which I'm happy about because I really dislike that airport. I'm sorry for my French uh, friends, or at least Persian friends. You'd be happy because Madrid is also there and the T4 when it's... You walk forever and ever and ever. Is not liked by pilots either. Yeah. Uh, we have to go there quickly because it was also news that was all over the internets and the media. It was two weeks ago, there was this crash of a 737 in Russia. I think it was close to having a hurricane when the plane attempted to land. And we still don't know what happened, but it seems to have been something to do with the weather and or, of course, a pilot error of course, possi potentially some problem within the aircraft itself. It's just a tragedy. And I made the mistake of watching the video, and that was, it was horrifying. Um, it is. And I think you know they circled for two and a half hours to try and attempt a landing in, in awful conditions. They they uh, aborted one, and it just it you know it didn't end well. I think there's a lot of speculation about why this happened, uh, and I think you know we'll know soon enough. But you know I, I don't want to get into that debate until we Agreed. until we know more. But uh, yeah, it's just a sad story from a from an otherwise very safe and reputable uh, airline in in Fly Dubai, an aircraft as well, the seven thirty seven. It's it's Funny and at the same time very sad how when these happen, everybody turns into an NTSB expert. Yeah. Guys, you know, we'll, we'll know soon enough. I won't put the videos uh, in the show notes because I'm not sure it's actually very useful. And if you uh, want a, no a non-gossipy, fact-based uh, resource for stuff like this, the Aviation Herald at avherald.com is, I mean, the comments always. are a different story altogether, but the As always. the posts are very factual, almost to a fault. That's where I go when I don't want to engage in any of the nonsense debate. Although this was uh, not a pilot error, the report uh, by the French authorities of the German wing crash has been uh, released. And it urges some type of regulation about uh, medical confidentiality for pilots with mental health issues, it was revealed that the co-pilot, because the crash was referred to a psychiatric clinic two weeks prior to the crash. Of course, that will be another long-lasting debate. I'll let you read uh, the link in the show notes if you're interested. Another crash, much less grave, uh, so I'm going more in my happy voice, uh, <laughs> but I'm still sad. Um, I wanted to report about how Harren Maiden, one of my favorite bands, actually decided to have a 747 for their tour. They used to use a 757 and they use our favorite aircraft, Alex and me, the 747 to fly around the world for their massive world tour for their new album. After a few dates, uh, sadly, uh, they had an incident on the ground in, in Santiago de Chile and basically one of the engines was badly damaged. There's some pictures, I'll put the link in the show notes and sadly they had to stop uh, using that aircraft. I hope they can find another one to lease. I'll put a lot of links in the show notes how it was inside, etc. because it was a dream. Imagine you're the singer of the one of the most well-known rock and roll band and you get to fly because he's a pilot as well and you get to fly your 747 around the world to get to all these places. 
what a dream it must have been. Uh, and so I really hope for Bruce Dick and Cinder Singer that they get to find another aircraft. Well, it looks like the plane is back in the sky. Oh, they've, wow. They've managed to patch it up and it is back in the sky. The folks over at Flight Radar 24 have been following this carefully and, and tweeted out that uh, it was uh, it was back up in the air. Well, see, I've not seen, I've not followed the news. I've been so busy this week. So if you want to follow, you can follow the tail ABD666. Uh, that's what you should put in a flight radar or plane finder on Twitter. The hashtag at force one is uh, the one you should follow. A lot of people are putting pictures. So, ah, wow, great news. Thank you, Alex. Now I'm happy again. So, yeah, <laughs> so I'll, I'll go on, on plane finder right after we end up recording the show to see where it is right now. Lift to fly, flight to live as the song of our main goes. Happy, since we are on this happy anniversary to ANA, their 30th anniversary of international service. They were precluded to fly internationally before 30 years ago. So now they actually, and I've been using them recently, I'm very happy. And they have a 100,000th flight of the 787. So they've wow. been that many flights and you and me are still unable to fly I it. Know, it's yeah. a, I know, I was all set to fly it to Tel Aviv. Then my plans changed and they operate it on the flight back that I was supposed to take, I think five times a week. But of course I was on one of the two days a week when they don't. <laughs> so the universe does not want us to fly that airplane yet. I'm only flying A380 soon because I'm flying uh, Emirates. I'm flying to uh, first Dubai, then Moscow. Uh, I think that's on a 777 though. And then uh, to Hong Kong on an A380. So no 787. Quickly Emirates, they've uh, done their inaugural flight Dubai to Auckland, which is the longest flight in the world. They've done, interestingly, they've done it on the A380, so it means it's possible, but they're going to run it on a 777-200 long range. Uh, it's a very, very long flight, 8,824 miles for, a, I don't know, God, many hours. I mentioned that, I think, a few episodes ago where I mentioned how the Earth was shaped and how you calculate those routes. It's not always a distance that makes a flight go longer. Sometimes you have flights that are seem actually less long. For instance, the Emirates to Panama, Dubai to Panama, is only 8,588 miles, but it takes 17 hours and 35 uh, minutes. Anyway, all that to say that uh, there's an interesting article in Skiff that basically says that these airlines are scouting for so many routes and they're running out of routes to use. And soon enough, we'll have no any new routes to implement because <laughs> they've been covering all the well. <laughs> it means that you and me, Alex, are still a long, long life of travel, so try them all before we die. But also something for you, Alex, because I know you like looking at the moving map when you are in flight. There's an app that allows you to know what is exactly under you Without the use of Wi-Fi. Yeah, this is really, really cool. I mean, it's it's covered in the Smithsonian Magazine, which is a great magazine, but it's called Fly Over Country, and it uses these maps and, and geology databases to figure out where you are and the, the geological and topographical points of interest points of interest uh, and and wonder you know so you you, you fly everything and go, what what the heck is that is it that mountain or that canyon or that valley well this app as you say does not need wi-fi to do that and i think this is this is fantastic it works with like cached wikipedia articles and it just it needs your phone's gps but that's it I'm going to use it uh, when I fly to Santa Barbara next week. And, you know, there's a lot of, of very interesting stuff in, in between the top and bottom of California. A quick another mention of Emirates. Uh, I'll talk about Emirates, of course, next time because I will have done this very long flight, which also means that we won't be able to record for at least uh, two weeks. Sorry, guys. Emirates is thinking about opening a route between Zurich and Mexico. The reason I mention it is, of course, first of all, it's another route, yet another but it's another fifth freedom route. You know, they already do Milan Malpensa to uh, JFK, to New York. I've always been a proponent of having more of these routes over Europe. I know that it makes the EU crazy and other airlines are shouting, et cetera. But it would be very interesting that they succeed to do so in opening that route. It would mean that you'd actually fly directly with Emirates from Zurich to Mexico and or you'll have a layover in Zurich going from uh, Dubai. So I wish there were more like that, especially in, in London for you and me, Alex. But Emirates was also the, the airline I flew the most with when I was living in Larnaca. In Larnaca. I was living in Limassol, which is only what, 30 minutes away from Larnaca, which is the main airport 
for uh, Cyprus, the airport we're covering today. Interestingly, I had first flown Etihad once from there and then I switched to Emirates for the first time. So I flew for the first time Emirates in 2010 because they had more routes to go to Asia. Larnaca, is it an airport you've ever visited or have you ever hijacked a plane to visit it? <laughs> no and no. You've never been to Cyprus? I've never been to You're Cyprus. To Brit. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> because every summer, the entire Great Britain would come live in Cyprus, it seemed, when I was living there. I'm very glad that they upgraded it because when I arrived for the first time in 2010, there was the old airport, which was honestly something you cannot even believe. It seemed to me that it was back in 1955 or something. The new airport is actually very nice. I regret one thing not living there anymore, besides, of course, the 11 month of summer per year. It's such a breeze to go from entering the airport to your gate. It takes less than three minutes. Uh, you know, it's a small island, thus a small airport. It was a breeze, and I really appreciated that. Other than that, very uh, modern airport. There's uh, nothing special about it. Only know that when you're going in the summer, because people mostly go to Cyprus in the summer, it can be a little bit crowded. So <laughs> you have not to listen to what I just said. You have to go a little bit in advance. Uh, but other than that, I've never had, it's a rare I can say that about an airport, I've never had ever an issue at that airport. Wow. And I used to fly it all the time because, again, it was my home base. I would go to that airport almost every week for two years and I never had an issue, which tells something of itself, right? It might not have been the greatest airport in the world, might not have been the most beautiful airport in the world, might not have been anything. It doesn't rank number one, but I never had an issue. It was always agreeable. So just for that, I give it my high marks. Is it a good airport for layovers? First of all, there's not a lot of chances you do a layover there because usually that's where you stop. So no, I mean, it's okay. I mean, you could sleep very well, but I mean, in Larnaca, you're only from the airport, you're 10 minutes away from the sea. You should go to the seaside and not stay within the airport when you have that around you. So I would just say it's not a good airport for layovers. I also got to see it from above. I was flying, taking a lesson, flying with a two-seater small aircraft and we had to wait to land back because all the big birds were landing and daylight was going down and I could see the lights appearing over the Larnaca airport. That was quite something for and for that as well I like it. The last story it's an anecdote. There's another airport in an island called Paphos. Paphos is a city which is literally no more than an hour by car. I used to fly KLM. They would fly a big fat white body, land in Paphos Wait half an hour, take off, and land for the final destination in Larnaca, which to me made no sense at all. Because basically, by the time you know you would have landed in in Paphos, if you had decided to go out of the plane, you could have reached the entire island before that aircraft would have joined Larnaca. So, <laughs> I don't know if that flight still exists. Guys, you should definitely try to check uh, Cyprus once, and you'll tell me about Larnaca Airport. On that, Alex, uh, you're staying in the U.S. for a little bit, I'm right? here for another three weeks and then uh, bouncing across the world to Singapore. Oh, yeah. Remember, we will probably be recording before you leave the U.S. and after I go to my own bouncing of the world, which is starting this Saturday. In the meanwhile, safe travels. Safe travels. On behalf of Layovers and the entire crew, we would like to thank you for joining us on this podcast today. And we're looking forward to seeing you on board again next week. Flight attendants, please prepare for landing.